thanks. I'm delighted and honoured to be with you all today in my capacity as Goodwill Ambassador for the UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency. And I want to thank Google for giving me this opportunity and this platform to speak to you, a group of individuals who have the potential and the power to transform the lives of refugees by revolutionising the very landscape of the response to the global refugee crisis. But first, a little history. Now, I've just finished reading The Silver Sword to my eight-year-old son, Iggy. And for those of you who don't know it, The Silver Sword is a children's book by Ian Serralier from the 1950s. And it tells a, a story of a Polish family who were devastated by the Nazi invasion of Poland that trickled, triggered World War II. And basically, they're split apart and become what we would now call displaced persons within their own country. And then after the liberation of Poland by the Russians, at the end of the war, they become refugees. They're not migrants, they're refugees. First and foremost, seeking safety and to reunite one another with one another in, um, in the safety of Switzerland. Now, it, I assure you that not all I do is uh, talk about refugees and read refugee stories to my children. And honestly, it was simply by chance that this story was so on message. And I had a vague recollection of it from my childhood and being filled with peril and adventure and nicely told so, I bought it for Iggy. And as we got further and further into the story, I realised that even though, even though it's very much of and from another time, and it really is of that time, it's also profoundly relevant to my eight-year-old's world and future, and indeed to the world that we are all entering now. It's about the good in people, and it's very much a call for an open reading uh, of the plights of those who are less fortunate than ourselves, of those whose lives have been upended and trashed by the impersonal uh, operations of war machines. And it's about the personal cost of the refugee crisis and the impact of the destabilisation on families, particularly children. So spoiler alert, the story does end happily and much of the success of the coming together of the family can be attributed to sheer dumb luck. And this is what really stayed with me, I think, that luck and coincidence here in this story are masterfully employed by Sir Allier to capture the fragility and the contingency of the character's existence. They are tossed about like corks on a storm. Now, as a storyteller, luck and coincidence are probably best used sparingly, if at all. Things can feel a little bit too easy, too pat, if, uh, the, and an audience switches off, I think, if the author uh, endlessly tries to bend the world to suit the outcome of their plot. But this book reminded me that in life, luck and chance surround us every day. Now, who hasn't felt the cold wind of the universe when you step back onto that curb after you were missed by that bus? just in the nick of time. And who hasn't wondered, if I didn't do that subject in school, would all this be different? And who doesn't look at a devastated family of refugees and realise that they're but for the grace of God? So chance is a big part of Ian Serralier's wonderful story because the children's lives are so very contingent and the randomness of the Nazis and the fluctuations of the war and the impenetrable logic of the bombings and the Russians and the Americans and the chaos of their normal daily life upended and overturned makes chance an even bigger player in their fragile lives. So chance, coincidence, life. Now, I was in Jordan about four or five weeks ago. It was my second visit to the region with UNHCR to see their frontline work and meet with, meet with Syrian refugees. And I had my husband, Andrew, with me and my youngest son, yes, Iggy, again. And the a camp is on the border, as many of you might know, on the border of Syria and Jordan. And it was quite literally built in the middle of the night, in the middle of the desert, in the headlights of UNHCR vehicles, as thousands of people flooded over the borders back in, uh, to seek safety back in 2012. So four years later, it is the home to nearly 80,000 Syrian refugees. And as we drove into UNHCR's base camp in Zaatri, I couldn't quite work out what I was seeing. There were bodies pressed up really close to the wall and huddled figures, head bent, and they were looking into their cupped hands. And then I noticed the thumbs. And I realised what was holding the focus of every, nearly every single one of these, mostly teenagers, it was their bloody phones. And here they were, they were standing in a sliver of a shadow from the sun, and they were showing great resourcefulness. They were tapping into UNHCR's base camp Wi-Fi. There were kids trying to connect with family back in Syria, 
with, they were WhatsApping with, with classmates, former classmates, now spread across Iraq, Lebanon, Turkey and further afield, downloading news and trying to get information to relay back to others in the camp. So this desire to connect is so strong in us because deep down we all know that you've got to be in it to win it. You have to be in the stream of life for chance to work its magic. So what binds us together, culture, language, life force, carries on and around and through us. And the only way to affect the world and our circumstances is by throwing a line into that stream. Some of us might have a plan. Some of us might even have an email address. But really what we're doing when we engage in the world in any way is opening ourselves up to the possibilities, to chance. Connectivity through these new technologies is on one level another very effective way for possibility and opportunity to enter and change our lives. It is the chance for chance to enter a life that has been torn adrift from its normality. Beyond the wealth of life force opportunity, a refugee's phone can literally, quite literally be a lifeline a single point of connection between a separated family. At base, it can be a repository of memory, a lifetime. Most refugees, uh, many of them in fact, that I, that I met, uh, had phones that had no connection, no signal, and so this phone became a precious store of photos and addresses from back home. It was the only images they had of extended family celebrations in more peaceful times. Since working with UNHCR, I have been gobsmacked that people think it's strange that when forced to flee, that refugees take their mobile phones, as if it's a sign that they're not really in need. They're playing to some crazy, outdated stereotype of what a victim in need actually looks like. And I tell you now, if my teenage son had to flee to avoid brutal military conscription and possible death, I'd want him to take his phone so I knew where he was and I knew he was safe. And if I had to gather up my children and take, take to a dinghy on the seas, I'd want my phone with me so I could let people know that I'd arrive safely and to work out what to do next or to reunite with separated family members. Now, clearly, I'm, like all of us, attached to uh, my phone, my iPad, my, my PC. I connect with my family. I, I bank. I shop a little bit too much. I search. But think about it. You take away that connectivity. How would your life look, your work, your opportunities? Now, I don't need to tell any of you in this room that over the last two decades, the internet and mobile communications have transformed, quite literally, the developed and developing world. It has darker sides, of course, but it has brought to the world tremendous economic and social benefits. The digital revolution transforming the world must not be allowed to leave refugees behind. A disconnect at this level would benefit no one. Anyway, back to Zaatri camp. Now, my first briefing in Zaatri was with UNHCR's camp manager, Hovig Etemezian. Now, Hovig explained the infrastructure of the camp, the water, the sanitation, the education, food distribution, and the healthcare systems that UNHCR, UNHCR has delivered and constructed with their partners. It was fascinating to me how you build what is essentially a city in, um, out of the desert in such a short amount of time. But more fascinating, beyond the physical construction was how UNHCR has developed systems of good governance to ensure a functioning, cohesive community, connectivity. Now, Hobbig showed me his phone. It's a vector, a nexus. It's a feeding point for information between him, UNHCR, and the refugee community. Text messages, tweets, voicemails, it's a constant back and forth conversation about service delivery what has gone wrong, what is going right, what needs improving, what needs celebrating, and what needs developing. I was blown away by the inventiveness and the inherently democratic energy that the connectivity has allowed UNHCR and the inhabitants of Zaatri. And we talked about it all the way back to our Wi-Fi enabled hotel rooms in Amman. Now sadly, the impressive level of connectivity in Zaatri is not reflected in many other refugee communities. In fact, UNHCR has recently completed a global assessment that has discovered that the vast majority of refugees are living without reliable connectivity. And many can't afford to be connected. And even when a network exists, refugees are 50% less likely than the local population to have an internet-enabled phone. But so important is it for refugees to um, be connected that they made huge sacrifices to do so. 
They sell food rations in order to buy data for their phone so that they can track family, monitor the situation back home, and access mobile transferring and financing services. It's quite literally a lifeline. So the need for these people is to connect is not a luxury, it's an absolute necessity. And it's a necessity not just at the point of emergency when people flee and become displaced, but also across the span of the person's displacement. Remembering, of course, that the average length of protracted refugee crisis is 25 years. And here, I want to briefly explain the scope and scale of UNHCR's work, in part because I think it will give a context to the opportunity of our hope that we can work together and to exploit, and partly because until recently, until the global refugee crisis touched the shores of Western Europe, many people had no knowledge or understanding of UNHCR and their unique mandate. So for over 60 years, UNHCR has been the world's leading organisation working for the forcibly displaced. Quite literally, UNHCR save li saves lives. When conflict forces people to flee, UNHCR is on the front line leading the emergency response, providing shelter, blankets, clothing, ensuring vital needs such as food, water and medical care are met. UNHCR gives hope. UNHCR understands what refugees need in order to carry on and build a better future, including education, training and access to livelihoods. And UNHCR seeks lasting solutions. They work with governments at the highest of levels to help millions of people find home again. And there's absolutely no point upon UNHCR's journey of support that would not be dramatically improved by refugees having access to available, affordable and usable mobile and internet connectivity family reunification, access to education, access to health information, legal advice on asylum rights and processes, cash assistance, ability to pursue livelihoods, safety and security alerts. The list goes on and on and on. So take 22-year-old Abshiro, for example. Abshiro fled Somalia back in 2014 with her then three-year-old daughter after her husband was killed by militants. She, like 60% of refugees worldwide, does not live in a camp but in a city, and in Abshiro's case, that's Nairobi. She works as a cleaner, and she used her friend's mobile phone to arrange jobs, and she's paid in cash, which for a single mother in a big, unfamiliar city is far from ideal from a personal security standpoint. She's currently unable to uh, register her daughter in school, so it's a very, very lonely and isolated existence for them. She isn't able to contact lost friends and family. She quite simply does not have the financial or technological means to do so. Nairobi is vast, and Abshiro doesn't always know where to find the basic NGO support in the city. And to access UNHCR's information and services, she has to travel a prohibitively long distance. And on top of that, current registration issues mean that there can be long delays in aid distribution. Connectivity would quite simply transform the lives of Abishiro and her little girl. She could use mobile banking to collect wages. She could download education content to read and teach her daughter. She could use social media to contact friends and family and to maintain a connection with her original community. She could receive aid notifications from NGOs, cash assistance via, via mobile money, uh, mobile, and mobile money to reduce her dependence on physical aid. And having mobile, a mobile identity would also ease the pain of aid distribution. I say again, connectivity would transform Abshiro's life. Make no mistake, we are in the middle of a catastrophic displacement crisis that has already uprooted millions and millions of innocent families that is creating a lost generation of uneducated children, and that is dredging up the most inane and damaging xenophobia and social dysfunction that I have witnessed yet in my lifetime, in our lifetime. The good conditions of which were mostly, in part, created by the victors of World War II, indeed, the creators of the UN, who attempted to make a society that would not fall into the terrible, terrible disrepair that had resulted in the, uh, the catastrophe of two world wars. But now, 70 years later, there are currently 60 million people across the world who are forcibly displaced from their homes because of conflict, persecution, and gross human rights violations, the most since World War II. 
Now, I could bombard you with statistics that over a quarter of Lebanon's population is now a refugee. That's like 15 million refugees coming to Britain. The numbers coming to Europe, the numbers drowning in the Mediterranean, the numbers on the move or stuck in camps in protracted crises in Africa, the funding needs, the funding gaps. It's concerning and it is overwhelming. And of course, the ultimate and lasting solution is political. We need peace and stability. But whilst we wait for that, we, as people with a voice, with access and influence, can and must play our part. Now, it feels like we're back at that old fork in the road. Do we go down the compassionate path or do we go down the path of intolerance? And it seems to me that the right and the only path to tread is the path of compassion. There's opportunity and there's hope down that path. And I think there's also a solution down that path. There's no solution down the path of intolerance. Not from a humanitarian perspective, not from a business perspective, not from a security perspective, and not if we want a society that makes sense.